Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The disciples asked, who then is this? The disciples asked this about Jesus, and we are still asking it today. Who is Jesus? What has he done? What does he mean to you? Why is any of it important? Why does this man who lived 2,000 years ago still have influence today? Why does this man who was born a long time ago, why do we orient all, all time of civilization around his birth and his death? Why do people gather every single Sunday and worship his name? Why do people put their hope into him? Who is this Jesus? It's a question that we answer as a church. It's a question that we all answer individually too. It's a question that maybe we have had to give an account for to somebody else. Who then is this Jesus? Throughout the Gospel of Mark, uh, it's really cool actually if you go through it, the people throughout the whole Gospel are actually asking this question in different ways and in different times, but they keep asking this question and they don't really get a full picture or a, or a complete answer. You notice our reading today then just leaves with this cliff, cliffhanger. Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this who controls creation? Throughout Mark, we try to learn it, getting bits and bits and bits until we get to the end. But, but, but the Gospel of Mark actually begins with the answer. It begins with verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's almost like the people in Mark's account of the Gospel are playing Jeopardy. In Jeopardy, the host gives the answer, and then the contestants have to come up with the question that matches the answer. So the answer at the beginning of Mark is, this is Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. Listen to him, trust him, have faith in him. It begins with an answer, and the questions come afterward. Now it's the goal of all four of the gospel accounts to tell us about the nation, nature and the person of Jesus Christ. Today's reading makes it abundantly clear that Jesus is both God and man, and that he has come to rescue. Jesus had had a full day of teaching and healing. And as the sun was going down, he decided to cross the Sea of Galilee. And once they were on their way, Jesus decided to take a nap. He had been teaching, attending to the needs of all the crowds all day. He was tired. His human nature. So he fell asleep in the stern of the boat. And then the storm struck. And it was bad. The boat was filling with water, and even these seasoned fishermen who had spent their whole lives, their livelihoods on this Sea of Galilee, even they were terrified because it looked like it was the end. But they found Jesus sleeping. They didn't mind when Jesus had nodded off earlier, but now what, the least that he could do is help to bail them out, to try to keep it from sinking. So they wake him and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Just a loaded sentence right there. But this indicates their desperation, knowing that this was, was vital, that they needed help. They went to Jesus. Because after all, Jesus had grown up building, and he was, experienced, well, he was not an experienced sailor. But they still went to him. It's at this time that Jesus does totally something unexpected that we just don't see. He actually scolds the wind and the waves. That's what our text tells us. He actually scolds it, like, like it's a group of unruly children, maybe at VBS. But he scolds the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And it happens. The wind ceases, and there was, and there was a great calm. Who then is this? 
who is this Jesus? He is, he is Lord of all. Lord over the wind and the sea. He is God's own very Son. He is the calmer of chaos and the one who has defeated sin in this world. He is our rescuer. N.T. Wright talks about in his commentary, in his, in his book about the Gospel of Mark, he sees the whole Gospel of Mark as the one who comes. Jesus is coming. The kingdom of God drawing near. This kingdom of God has come into this world and it is drawing nearer and nearer in the person of Jesus Christ as we learn more about him. He says that Jesus calls and that he heals. He forgives. He corrects. He persuades. He teaches. He does this all throughout the Gospel of Mark. He is answering this question of who he is. But his own disciples still do not understand, and they still are asking the same question. We may be asking the same question today. Maybe not from a position of strong faith, but maybe of, of a faith that is beaten and broken like the boats in the Sea of Galilee. Maybe we are asking that question today because we have maybe something on our mind, something on our conscience that we can't get off, and we keep coming to God, and we don't seem to get that answer. We keep asking, who then is this Jesus? Well, you know, if you take a pair of binoculars um, and, and you put them up, you, you can see things that are very far away. But I don't know, if you guys ever done this where you flip the binoculars around, and actually things that are really close start to seem really far away, you start to get this really weird effect. Well, I think that's what we need to do with our text today. We need to flip the binoculars around, and we need to take our text of what is close, and we need to see the bigger picture. We need to see way back of what Jesus is doing and the bigger picture of what this text is driving us to. See, we don't really get the answer to this question of who then is this Jesus in our reading. We actually have to go to the end of Mark. Where the whole gospel actually culminates in chapter 15, verse 39. We have had throughout the whole gospel of Mark, who then is this Jesus? Who is it? Who is it? We get little glimpse, little pockets of who this Jesus is. But it's not till verse 39 in chapter 15 where we really see who Christ is. That verse says this. The centurion stood there in front of Jesus, and he saw how he died, and he said, here it is, Surely this man was the Son of God. Surely this man was the Son of God. In verse 1, we, we hear Jesus, there's a gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and it's not till the very end that we get that assurance, that promise again, that this Jesus who lived in this world, who walked this earth, who forgave sins and healed many, this is the Son of God. It's only through the cross of Jesus Christ that we really see who, who God is. It takes Jesus hanging on the cross for a person to fully know who Christ is. The centurion was not one of Jesus' disciples. It was not somebody who followed him around. He was not who you would expect to have the gospel proclamation at the end of the gospel. But from his lips to us today, the proclamation rings true. That surely this man was the Son of God. The disciples asked, who then is this? They could tell that he had power over creation, over the wind and the sea here in chapter 4, but it is not until the cross, and when they see the resurrected Christ, that they know who this Jesus is. It's really like if, if we were to, to take these binoculars and really, instead of coming in front of this cross and talking, that we needed to actually come behind it. I was going to move this out here, but I know the altar guild um, is going to get a little worried about that. But you see this cross? The Gospel of Mark is actually telling us 
that we need to be behind the cross, seated in front of it, on our knees, looking at it for us to understand it. It is through this cross that we know who Christ is. The life of the Christian, then, is one where we stand at the foot of the cross, where we come to it and we speak to others the gospel message that we hear from it. That we are forgiven. That we are redeemed. That Christ took our sins on this cross. See, we take the binoculars and we have to see the whole picture. Not just little snippets. We see the whole picture. What Mark is telling us is that we have to look to the cross to understand it all. Without the cross, we're only getting a tiny fragment. We're not getting who Christ is. But when we come to the cross, we see the clearest picture that we have of Christ. We see the clearest picture of his love for us. As God's people look to the cross. We talked a little about this last week. Look, look to the cross of Christ where he bore our sin. Look to the cross for life's answers. No matter our sin, no matter how it plays out, no matter what wrong we have, Christ addressed it at the cross. The disciples say that, that he is Lord over the wind and the sea, but what a clearer picture that we have today, that we are blessed with, that we can look to the cross. Mark is telling us the cross is where we go. Jesus saves the disciples, and he still saves us today by his work on this cross. It is still going today. For Christ's life was matchless, his goodness is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his love never changes, his word is enough, his grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, and his rescue is eternal. His rescue is eternal. Martin Luther uh, has, has, has a prayer. It's actually called his flood prayer. We, we had a baptism uh, the other week. It's actually part of our uh, baptismal liturgy that we normally use. And in this prayer, he talks about the holy ark of the Christian church. I, I'm going to read this prayer uh, written by Luther. He says, Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, yet led your people, Israel, through the water on dry ground, prefiguring the washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold this person according to your boundless mercy and bless him or her with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in him or her which has been inherited from Adam, in which he himself has committed since, would be drowned and die. Listen to this part. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit, spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A, a wonderful prayer. He goes through the, the history of water in the Old Testament, how that prefigures, how that points us to the baptism that would come. And the, and the line where he says, that the, that the Christian church is a holy ark. The Christian church, being a follower of Jesus Christ, means that you are on a boat with other people. It means that we all together in Christ's name are floating along on this boat. And sometimes, yes, it feels like Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, not doing much about where it's going. And when storms arise, it feels like he's not listening or he's not there. But this boat, this church that you and I are a part of by the blood of Jesus Christ, he is not asleep. He is not far off. 
He is listening. He is caring. He is leading. He is leading this boat, this church, by his will to his glory. Luther is talking about all of us. And he is talking about a rescue through the waters of holy baptism. This rescue that God gives us from sin, death, and the devil. This rescue that happened at the cross. And that was sealed with the promises of God three days later when Christ arose. This past week for VBS, we, um, on the second to last day, we went and um, there was a, the Bible activity where, where kids each got a, a dirty rag and they were to put it on the cross and to think about a sin in which they had committed and how God had forgiven them that sin. This rag that they put up there was forgiven. And we took the cross and we put it in, in, in front of everybody for our, for our big group gathering. And it, and it was a wonderful representation where the kids understood that their sins, their personal sins in which they had done, were forgiven by Christ. Throughout the whole week, we talked about Christ's rescue. Each day, we, we hit a different point. Um, and, and every day, we went through and we said, Jesus Rescue. So you're going to do that with me here now. We would say, when you are blank, and everybody would say, Jesus rescues. It was, it was a wonderful day every time, and the kids got louder and louder each time and every day. So, so help me with this now. When you're lonely, Jesus rescues. When you worry, Jesus rescues. When you struggle, Jesus rescues. When you do wrong, Jesus rescues. When you're powerless, Jesus rescues. Jesus has rescued all of us. Through loneliness, through our weariness, through struggling, through doing wrong, our sins, through being powerless, he has come and rescued us by the blood of his son, Jesus. This story is more about, about a, a parable about the storms in your life and how Jesus is going to be through there. It is more than this. It is way more than that. Though that is true, it's about so much more. It's about this picture of Christ. It's about this rescue that we get little bits and pieces and finally culminates on the cross. It's about us asking the question of who then is this Jesus? And God answering us. God answers with his son, Jesus Christ, who loves you and he loves me with a love unimaginable, uncomparable, unprecedented, and unparalleled in this world. Who then is this Jesus? He is God's son. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. Let us continue to put our faith in him, our trust, and our hope. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we know that you came into this world. Lord, we know that you have rescued us by your work on the cross and your rising again. Lord, we are lonely. We are worried. We are struggling. We have done wrong. And Lord, we are powerless. But Lord, you have rescued us. Continue to let us rejoice in this fact. Let us know this. Let us praise your name. Let us praise that we are forgiven and redeemed by your blood. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.